Hello, and welcome to episode 63 of the Talk Witchcraft podcast. In this episode, Erica and I will be talking about spiritual healing. In today's fast-paced world, more and more people are turning to alternative medicines and therapies to treat ailments, illnesses, and diseases. Let's discuss the pros and cons of engaging in spiritual healing practices. You're listening to Talk Witchcraft. On this podcast, we talk about witchcraft as a lifestyle and discover how to merge magic into your daily life. Every week, we'll demystify witchy topics like tarot, astrology, crystals, herbs, and more as you develop your personal brand of magic and create the life of your dreams. We're We're your your hosts, hosts, the Mystic Mystic Sisters, Sisters, Erica and Maggie. In this segment of the show, we choose a tarot card for the week, and we look for moments that relate to this card in our daily lives. For this episode, we chose the Ten of Cups. The theme of this card is it doesn't get any better than this. When I see this card, the excess is in the joy and the love that these people are experiencing. This is excessive, the ultimate level of happiness. These people win at life. So to me, this is like the end of that feel-good movie, and they lived happily ever after. It's when the camera zooms out, and it's the final scene where everything's worked out, and we're all like, yay, and the credits roll, and we all think, isn't that nice? This is lovely for a finite story, but what about real life? This is a moment in time, and I want them to enjoy this moment. I don't want them to rush past it, but I do want to know what comes after the happily ever after. Are they just going to stand and stare at this rainbow forever? No, probably not. The rainbow will fade away. The kids will get bored and start fighting. They'll go back to the mundane life and they're asking, what's for dinner? And did you pay the mortgage? Right. So in this card, the rainbow, it's a symbol of a promise. It appears after the rain when the sun returns and is a reminder of growth that comes after the rain. So when I think of this card, it's a promise of a recommitment to seek moments like this in my day-to-day life. Maybe every moment won't be pure bliss like this, but maybe there is some sliver of joy I can recognize and be grateful for. I'm going to talk about my wedding to Dana because that day was just pure magic. And, you know, I look back on it and I think about how happy we were, we were surrounded by all these people who just wanted to celebrate us and be there for us and, you know, spend time with us. And it's a magical moment. I mean, it just was that moment. Obviously it doesn't last forever. You can't just like, we, we didn't live in this world where we're always surrounded by people who only want to show their love to us, (laughs) but I can still look back at that moment. If I'm ever feeling sad, I can remember, you know, there's this, this, there's this, all these people who love us. (laughs) We have this amazing community of family and friends. I mean, it, it kind of like felt like this card standing at the altar and like looking at him and looking out at the people sitting in the chairs. And there was obviously a lot of things that went wrong. It was a wedding. (laughs) There's always things that go wrong. But for the most part, like the things I remember about that day were like the smiles on people's faces, the way I felt, and just the general like feeling of love. And that's, that's what this card represents. Well, I was just going to say, because I happened to have been there. Really? My sister? (laughs) My moment of joy from that day was when, so you had two bridesmaids, me and your really good friend, and then our mom were all kind of left up at the cabin, and our mom drove us down. And we had a photographer, you know, like Maggie picked out a really wonderful person, a team of individuals. They got some great images. But my favorite picture from that day was Maggie sitting in the fr- front seat of the car and I'm sitting behind her in the passenger seat and she's leaning against the window, looking out the window as we're driving down to the ceremony site. And I just snapped this picture with my cell phone be- from behind it and this I, you could feel her joy and excitement and this moment of calm in the bustle and busyness that the, had been the rest of the day. And I, so like that moment for me was that moment of joy. Like the, it can't get better than this. 
Yeah, it's been a while since I looked at the pictures like that were not professionally done, but I should go back and look at that because I do remember, you know, you shared that picture on Facebook and it's a good one. (laughs) What about you, Erica? My story isn't really like a specific time. I mean, I guess that was my story, but um, joy is one of my core values and um, it's really important to me as a like a life's mission to help other people find their joy, to find that 10 of cups moment. As I've discovered this and realized that I myself at my core, I am a joyful person and that it's not about making other people feel joyful. It's not about me changing their outlook or their personality. It's about me opening their eyes to opportunities to be joyful. In all honesty, that just makes me an an enabler for anything, because I'm of the opinion that, you know, with spending money or spending time or doing things, if it's going to bring you joy in the now, like, why are you hoarding your money for a maybe in the future when you have something right now that you have the money to spend on and it's going to bring, bring you joy right now in this moment? And so that's that's where I'm at with joy. That I, I It's something that you should feel internally in the moment and not save it for another day. Yeah. Or, or when you're like using, you're saving your special candles for something later. It's like, no, use them right now. Yeah. Every moment could be special. If you, if you use the special candles, this moment becomes the most special moment. (laughs) Exactly. And so the most recent time where this has come out is we have a good friend who he loves anything CSU sports related. He has had season tickets to football games for years, for the basketball games. They just built a brand new stadium. He got the the season tickets last year. They were outdoor seating and it wasn't bringing him joy. And so this year he has an opportunity to buy a new set of tickets that's way more expensive, but it has an indoor piece to it. And so on those days where it's, like a late night game, or it's really cold, he has the opportunity to go inside and watch the game and bring back that joy that he was missing last year. So he's talking about it. And I don't give a lickety split about sports. But for that piece of helping other people find their joy, I was like, you know what, dude, this is something that's going to make you so happy and it's going to bring back that enjoyment that you had lost and you only live once, right? So like I say, go for it. Buy the really expensive sports tickets. Do what you need to do. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's exactly it. Um, Knox is back here telling me that the only thing that will bring him joy in this moment is if I feed him. So I'm just going to go ahead and take one short break because otherwise he's going to meow at me the whole time. Okay. So. <laughs> Hi, baby. Come on. Come on. Now, if you have a story that you want to share with us about the Ten of Cups, please send us a voicemail to we listen at talkwitchcraft.com. As we mentioned, we're talking about spiritual healing today. So in this episode, we'll talk about how spiritual healing can be dangerous in terms of victim blaming, toxic positivity, and other things. Later on, we'll share some methods and practices for spiritual healing. But before all that, let's start by talking about what spiritual healing is. Spiritual healing is a type of therapy where healing energy is channeled from the spirit realm into the body and directed to the area that needs to be healed. This can be done by an individual or with the help of another person. Most spiritual healers look at the interconnectedness of the body, mind, and spirit. Therefore, any health problem that emerges must be addressed in all three areas. The overall goal of spiritual healing is to maintain balance in these three areas. It is a very holistic approach to healthcare. I personally can see the appeal to this. It's an alternative to more invasive treatments in Western medicine. It's also much less expensive than seeing a doctor, especially in the U.S., where healthcare, medication, and insurance costs are inflated. However, I believe that Western medicine should be part of a holistic healthcare plan when needed. Right. Many spiritual healers will vilify drugs and medication of any kind. 
there's no shame in taking medication and it doesn't make you any less spiritual if you do. One of my favorite quotes is, if your body doesn't make its own, it's okay to have store-bought chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the Ida... Ida Gardner, yeah, does she yeah. say that? Every week in our podcast, I share the medicinal properties of an herb, and there are scientific studies that give legitimacy to herbalism, and many pharmaceuticals are created from synthetic replication of these herbs. But we also know that herbs cannot cure everything. And I see a lot of times people will take this spiritual healing way too far. I follow many prominent spiritual healers online, and almost all of them will say that medical problems start with the mind and then manifest into other symptoms that become evident in a physical form. So on the surface, that may seem harmless, but if you think about it, it implies that any physical sickness or disease is your fault because you thought of it. It may not be entirely victim blaming, but it's definitely creeping towards the edge of that, that, you know, your mind has created this illness for whatever reason, because there's something messed up in you. And it's not just like chance. And we're absolutely seeing a lot of this with response to COVID-19. There's a mix of people who were unwilling to wear masks from the beginning. And then when the vaccine came up, available, they were unwilling to get vaccinated. So obviously there's a political divide, but a huge number of people who don't want to wear masks or get vaccinated are from the spiritual community. And their reasoning, at least what I've heard from a lot of these people who are spiritual and also anti-mask or anti-vax, they tend to say that they're healthy. Their physical, mental, and spiritual health will protect them from the virus. I was looking into checking out what Reiki is. It was, for me personally, there was one practitioner who blatantly on their website said that they don't wear masks in session and they are unvaccinated and that if the potential client didn't adhere to those beliefs, then this was not the place for them. And I was like, well, that thanks for telling me that because that made me so super uncomfortable that I'm exposing my energies to a person whose belief system is so fundamentally different from mine and, the, and that they're willing to overlook the risks of potentially giving their clients an illness. Or for themselves that they might. I mean, they're coming into contact with so many people if they have a practice in person and all of those people have different germs. As a practitioner myself of speech language therapy, I've been wearing masks with my kids because kids are one of the most at risk groups, especially since there isn't a vaccine available for our little littles. It's a sign of of respect to them that I'm encountering all of these people throughout the day and I want to protect you from whatever I've picked up. And and we want, I want to be clear that like this one Reiki person that you encountered is not representative of all people who are Reiki practitioners. No, absolutely not. But it is it is common. And it's just this idea that like, if you wear a mask, then you don't believe that you can heal yourself. It's just like completely denying science. And there is room. We say it all the time. There's room for science and for spirituality. Exactly. They can coexist. <laughs> And also on the on another note, there's a ton of fat shaming, like only fat people can get COVID and also disability, chronic illness, all of those things, just shaming the heck out of it and even ageism. So, you know, that's looking at the physical help of, pe of people. But of course, when we look at the numbers, especially early on, but even now the virus did not and does not discriminate. Not at all. Like there's a huge variety of people. I've heard people say, well, I'm young, I'm healthy. I can handle it if I get it. But there's a lot of young and presumably healthy people who got COVID and are either are experiencing long COVID that will probably affect them for the rest of their lives or passed away. And that is so tragic. And it just completely disregards that. And then it shouldn't matter. Right. It shouldn't matter if you're young and healthy. Absolutely not. <laughs> because wearing a mask is about protecting other people. Mm -hmm. So the way I think about it, it's just really selfish. And then as for mental health, you know, we talked about like the physical health aspect, but when it comes to the mental health, there's a lot of toxic positivity in a lot of the ways that people talk about spiritual healing. There's a statement like, if I believe that I won't get it, I won't get it. If I believe that I'm healthy, I'll be healthy. Or only negative people get sick. If I'm just positive all the time, I won't get sick. Or the virus will get stronger 
anger, the more that we talk about it. So don't talk about it and it'll go away. It's all that like manifestation, believe it and then see it stuff. And it's not uncommon. Yeah. And it's very wishful and magical thinking. It's not based in reality. As magical and spiritual people, we're stuck between this rock and a hard place because there's this feel this you know, we've talked about manifestation. We've talked about saying things until they come true. And it's absolutely something that we believe in that manifestation piece, but not when it comes to the detriment of other humans and not believing in science and not valuing knowledge of other more experienced, more educated people. And bringing up the magical thinking, this isn't like super topical, but it's something that I've been marinating on for a while since I learned that Donald Trump's dad was a big proponent of magical thinking. He was very toxically positive. And I'm sure that that influenced Trump and all of uh, his brothers and sisters. Uh, they weren't allowed to talk about illness or anything negative throughout their entire, ch- entire childhood. And I can't imagine how much that would mess somebody up. I mean, I've listened to interviews of people who had toxically positive parents and how that messed them up. So much. And it doesn't excuse that he was such a tyrant in his adulthood, but we can still like have compassion for that and learn from how toxic positivity can influence the people around us. And he said in a, in that interview that was it wasn't like leaked but he was just stupid for saying it to a per, to a person of the press that he didn't want to share the truth about what was going on with the virus and how many people it was hurting and how quickly it was spreading because He didn't want to scare people and he didn't want to make it worse. So that's got to be influenced by the way he was raised. Right. And if he wasn't allowed to talk about illness in his childhood home, then of course that's going to transfer to not talking about illness as an adult. And I imagine it would make anybody raised in that kind of environment have a hard time breaching that taboo that has been a part of their world for their entire life. The difference being Trump wasn't willing to grow and change and learn and become a different person and grow from it. Yeah. And, you know, we all have that. That's part of what we see as a benefit of witchcraft is is that personal development, self-reflection, self-knowledge thing. I even had a comment on Instagram recently that said, witchcraft is mostly doing the homework my therapist gives me, but with better incense, candles, and baths, which I thought was perfect. And so people who are really invested in spiritual healing will also be invested in making sure that your mental health is actually healthy and not just this toxic positivity victim blaming stuff. Right. And that, you know, kind of brings us to this holier than vow attitude that's so prevalent in the spiritual community. You've told me that you once heard spiritual people exist on a higher frequency and therefore the virus can't detect them. I when you told me I like I couldn't believe that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's not just like one person. I've heard several people say that publicly on their, you know, social media, even in like news interview that they're just like, oh, I vibrate at such a high level that the virus can't find me. So here's an example of something like that. The virus couldn't find me. My roommate tested positive for COVID. I work with her and I live with her. And when I took my COVID test, I tested negative. I don't think it's because I'm a higher, holier than thou spiritual person. I think it's because I had my vaccine, my first dose of vaccine more recently than her. She got hers at the beginning of January 2021. I got mine at the end of February. So we were almost two months apart in getting our first dose. And then I also had had my booster and she was signed up to get her booster on the day that she tested positive. So there was a bigger gap between her second dose and her booster. And I had a shorter gap between my second dose and a booster. That's why I didn't get it. Right. (laughs) Or rather, that's why I didn't test positive. I had a few symptoms, but I think my immune system was better built up to fight it off. Right. Because you gave your immune system a roadmap and like a blueprint of exactly what to look for to fight off. (laughs) So it had nothing to do with my higher spiritual frequency and everything to do with the science behind vaccines, which have been long, long since proven. 
And of course, there's a lot of people who with this vaccine, they don't think they think about it as experimental. It's not. It's been it's just like a lot of study from other previously developed vaccines that they were able to apply to this virus. And that's how they were able to do it so quickly. But that's besides the point. (laughs) And it's it's sort of just an anomaly why some people get it and some people don't. You know, sometimes things just happen and it's nobody's fault. So anyway, all of this is to say that spiritual healing can can become toxic when it's taken to the extreme. So for example, if you blame yourself or someone else for manifesting their illness, when you shame people who aren't in perfect health or who prefer the help of prescribed drugs and Western medicine, and when you refuse to do the bare minimum to help your community during a global health crisis. Exactly. We are clearly very passionate about this issue. And that is because both Erica and I have a belief that being part of the human population requires caring for other people. And it's in human nature to build community and to take care of the weakest among us and to build each other up because we do better when we work together. And I think it's also important to just recognize that we're not against trying to heal yourself without Western medicine if that is something that you want to do. What the issue is, is that it feels that some people can take it to this point of like selfishness, that because they have been able to keep themselves healthy, that they have been able to do it through, you know, alternative health practices, that they don't need to be part of the collective any longer. There's a time and the place for both methods of healing. A combination of holistically healing yourself involves both herbs and synthetic drugs. It involves both prayer and meditation and going and seeing your doctor. It involves staying home and wearing your mask and getting your vaccine, but also thinking positively and manifesting good health for yourself. So all of these things are a holistic approach and all of them help better humanity as a whole. When you step outside of that and think that you're better than or more spiritually enlightened than or above the average person, that's where we run into trouble. And that's where Maggie and I get passionate. I guess the, to sum up what we're trying to say, spiritual healing has its place and don't judge other people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Although we just judged a bunch of people for like 30 minutes. <laughs> so yeah. So here's the thing though. It's okay to be intolerant of intolerance. And I, I guess even what we're, I think we're not judging people. I think it's more like holding people accountable for their actions. Yes. So we'll take a brief break. And after the word from our sponsor, we'll talk about some of the ways that you can incorporate spiritual healing into your overall health and wellness rituals in a helpful and unharmful manner. <laughs> Have you ever been to a baby shower or seen a person put the wedding ring of an expectant mother on a string to hold over her tummy? It's believed that the gender of the baby can be predicted by the way the ring swings. This game is a form of pendulum divination. At Precious Pendulums, we carry a variety of pendulums for all your divination needs. If you need a small weight attached to a string or chain, we've got it. Whether you prefer a beautifully polished crystal, a sculpted bit of pottery, a natural piece of rock, or a cast metal charm, you'll find it at Precious Pendulums. Use your pendulum to answer all of life's questions. Does he love me? Am I going to get this job? Did I make the right decision? And more. Come in today before Ostara and get 20% off your first pendulum. So if you are interested in practicing spiritual healing, here are a couple of methods to incorporate into your health and wellness arsenal. One of the most common methods of spiritual healing is meditation, which involves Generally, it involves sitting quietly in place and focusing on your breathing because its purpose is to bring balance to the body, the mind, and the spirit. It is very much aligned with the beliefs involved with spiritual healing of bringing balance to the body, the mind, and the spirit. 
Now, I also want to mention that meditation doesn't always have to be sitting in place. I talked about this in my story recently that my version of meditation is to do movement meditation because my ADHD doesn't allow for me to sit still. I think I've talked about it on the podcast even before. Mm -hmm. So as long as the focus of the meditation, as long as there's some aspect of it that your breath is what moves you and your breath is what your like mind is focused on that meditation can be beneficial to that balance i find that meditation kind of sneaks up on me and like i'll be sitting reading a book and all of a sudden i'm not reading anymore and i'm off pondering the existential world and the what is you know everything that's happening (laughs) that was really that was really eloquent (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure when you're meditating, it's much more. It's profound. That's the thing. It's like you can't put it into words. And in, in your mind, you're like, whoa. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, it doesn't. And, and this this is just my take on all things witchy is it doesn't have to be a prescribed set in stone, hard and fast, like rigid rule. You don't have to do it one way just because somebody said that's the right way to do it. You don't have to sit on your little poof with some Tibetan chimes in the background and like incense burning with this like ritual with a capital R. You can be laying in your bed or in the shower or in your car and have a meditative moment. But if that is the kind of meditation that you want, then that's okay too. Right. Another common method of spiritual healing is prayer. This involves communicating with a higher power or deity in order to seek guidance and strength. Prayer can be a very powerful form of healing as it can help you connect with something larger than yourself. Yeah. And we often talk about on this podcast that there's all of these different words that we use and they have certain associations. And so prayer is often thought to be a religious thing, but behind the prayer is the intention. And so prayer for healing, the intention is healing. So you can also consider this, you know, a spell for healing or an affirmation for healing or whatever word makes sense to you, where you're, again, like Erica said, connecting with something bigger than you, something outside of yourself. And like when we were talking about before, the spiritual healing is channeling spirit energy through your body to the place that needs to be healed. So you're channeling something from outside into your body. You're asking something outside yourself for help and guidance. Yep. So a third technique for spiritual healing is to use crystals, and each crystal has its own unique properties. A lot of crystals have specific areas that are they they connect with more. So that can that's something that you can research, but you can also just charge the crystal with your own intention to heal the part that you want to heal. Whatever crystal you choose to use, just you can hold it in your hands and in meditation or while praying, and it the power of the crystal can enhance that prayer or that meditation. You can place it on a specific part on your body, maybe the place that needs to be healed or placing them around your house can like just give a general aura of healing. I have a coworker who I adore. Um, She's just beginning her witchy journey. She is a crystal witch through and through. She's just beginning to get into tarot and like that kind of divination process. But I see her crystals are very earthy so she is just like a witch based in the earth which is so funny because I'm all earth in my zodiac but I reach for things that are more fluid and like watery and airy anyway that was a tangent she always has crystals on her (laughs) and she always has the perfect crystal for the exact right moment just with her. My favorite story is she was supervising one of our SLPAs and I happened to be working at the same location that day. And there was a kiddo who came in and he was having a hard day for for, at school. And she just whipped a crystal out of her bra that had been like being safe kept next to her all day long. So it was like fully charged with positive energy. And she just like pulled it out and she's like, here, I have this crystal for you. It'll help keep you safe at school. And I don't know exactly what crystal it was, but I'm sure it had some sort of protective quality to it. The mom was like super thrilled that she gave her son a rock. And (laughs) it was like, it was the best moment. (laughs) 
<laughs> that reminds me of the episode of Bob's Burgers. It's kind of a newer episode, I think, in the most recent season. But Tina's having a really hard time with public speaking, and she goes in to talk to the guidance counselor, Mr. Frond, I think is his name. But he gives her a crystal that his girlfriend had given him, and Tina becomes this amazing public speaker. And in some ways, it's sort of that placebo effect that she thinks she has this magic charm, and so that gives her more confidence, which is sort of how crystals work, if you ask me, that you tell yourself that you're going to do the thing and then you do the thing. Anyway, then all the other students are fighting over it and it ends up breaking and Tina gets all nervous because she has to do this big presentation and she doesn't have her lucky charm, but she ends up doing okay. She ends up doing the presentation just fine because at that point she's already proven to herself that she is capable of giving the presentation without like sweating under her boobs and stuff. (laughs) The last thing that you can also use is herbs. Herbs have also been used in spiritual healing for centuries upon centuries, and each herb also has its own unique properties and can be used to treat a variety of conditions, as we have seen in all of our podcast episodes where we talk about the various herbs. So you can use herbs to drink them as a tea, add them to your food, or use them in aromatherapy through their essential oils. One of my most eye-opening moments as I was starting to learn more about herbs was just how much we use herbs without even realizing what they are. You know, the, the best example is caffeine. Caffeine comes from a plant. It's used to stimulate the body. The other one is uh, aspirin. It's a synthetic of willow bark, and willow bark was used centuries before to help relieve pain. So if, as you start looking at the pharmaceutical medicines that you're taking, you absolutely can go back through time to find the plant that originated its use. I have a friend of a friend whose job He works for a pharmaceutical company, and his job is to go into the jungles of Africa and South America and go to the moors of Scotland and England and go to the Himalayan mountains and the swamps of wherever in the world to find the plants and find the folklore around these plants so that he can bring them back to his pharmaceutical company and they can figure out a way to synthesize them. Yeah, and that's a much more sustainable way to, you know, mass produce these medications that are super healing Mm -hmm. without exploiting the environment. Exactly. Without, you know, harvesting all the plants, you can synthesize it. So it's even more environmentally friendly to use the synthesis. And also, uh, just getting back to our conversation about shaming people who take medication, the pharmaceutical companies can enhance the natural properties of those plants Mm -hmm. and really isolate it. Right. Because when you're doing only herbs, you have to take it in higher quantity. Um, So back to the willow bark, you have to use a significant amount of willow willow bark to replicate the effects of one aspirin. So basically what they're doing, the chemistry behind it is they're finding the properties of the willow bark Mm -hmm. that are the pain reliever, removing them, and then making more of that. And so, you know, I've, I've talked before about the cautions of not using it in too, too much or too often. And that's why if we want to get the same effect of one aspirin and we're using willow bark and we're doing it too much, it can overrun our system. Right. And so it's not a bad thing to use pharmaceutical drugs. The issues around pharmaceuticals is a greed factor and that's a human factor, not a chemical factor. Right. It's not like scientists are putting in like poisons into these pharmaceuticals. It's that they're patenting the formula that comes from a natural source that should be available to everyone and making a ton of money off of it. And the fact of the matter is the reason they have to do this is because in order for it to be safe for human consumption, it has to be standardized and you can't standardize a plant. Every leaf has a different amount of constituents, a different amount of active ingredients. And if you can't be like, well, just take three leaves, it'll be fine. (laughs) Right. Well, and the other part is that in like with the willow bark example, 
there's other components to the willow bark than just the painkillers. Right. I, I'm not sure if specifically for that example, if it's harmful to have an overdose of those other components. And that's part of why, but with other plants, that's part of it, that it's not necessarily the piece that you're looking for, for healing that could be harmful. It's like the other parts of that plant. Right, exactly. And so what they're doing is they're isolating the constituents and the actions out of the plant and into a pill. So you're only getting the painkiller relief. Right. So we were supposed to be talking about how you use herbs for healing. And we still think that that is a beneficial thing to do. Absolutely. But of course, we got sidetracked into this other conversation. And I think it was important. Yeah. And so, yeah, so herbal remedies and herbal medicines are best used as a preventive measure. So taking ashwagandha on a regular basis as a daily vitamin, as a daily part of your daily routine is going to help set up your body and get those components into the system for prevention of crisis moments. So ashwagandha is used for, you know, to help against depression and other mental health things. And so if you've got this buildup of ashwagandha in your system already, when you have a depressive episode, it's more likely to be a milder form. I'm not a doctor. (laughs) (laughs) I was thinking about this in terms of like with Anna and her hands and her pains that she was having and the essential oils that she was using for that. She had that appointment with the woman who was like, helping her figure out what she needed in those oils pretty much weekly, maybe, maybe monthly mom would know. And I think part of what was really helping her to feel better was that physical touch from somebody else and the massage and all of that, not to discount the benefits of essential oils. I think they also have a time and a place and are useful, but I think that's another spiritual healing aspect that we should mention is that physical touch and massage and all of that kind of stuff. Even if you massage your own hands or you use tools to help you with that, those that's another way to heal. Yes. And I agree with that. My boyfriend, he rubs my knee almost every night. And um, I know for him, like he does it out of love and that he wants to for me, but it's not his most favorite thing in the world. He does it because he knows it makes me feel good, but he still encourages me to like, hey, your knee is really bothering you. Maybe you should go talk to a physical therapist. So it's it's, again, that holistic piece of... He's not a medical practitioner. He's not a licensed massage therapist. He's just a boyfriend who loves me and wants me to feel better. And so his approach is like, I'm going to do this to help you because I love you. But I also want you to get better in a permanent capacity because I don't want you hurting anymore. I think what's nice about the spiritual healing world is that holistic approach, is that looking at what the cause of the disorder is. A lot of times in Western medicine, it's just about fixing the symptoms. It's just about the immediate relief. It, It takes a really long time in Western medicine to get to the root cause and actually fix it for the long time. A lot of it is about, well, you have the symptom, take this pill, or you have the symptom, go see a physical therapist, or the symptom, you need to see a mental health professional. And not really being like, hey, you know what, your knees jacked up, it might be because you don't have enough strength in your hips. And so let like, figuring out a way to fix it for all time. And I think that the spiritual community and the holistic of approach really does look at what it, what is the core issue and how do we fix the core issue. Yeah, I think that's an important thing to remember that like even though we are pro western medicine that there are issues there as well and there are valid criticisms of the way that a lot of like physicians approach healing like you said. So it's that holistic approach that if everybody was open to more spiritual healing aspects of that holistic approach, including Western practitioners, then that would be really beneficial for us all, like just all coming together. (laughs) I've heard of, and I would love to have a doctor who is like, wow, here, you should take ashwagandha, or I think some acupuncture would be really great for you, or here's a prescription to go get a massage every week. And on top of that, I'm going to prescribe this medicine for you or whatever Western medicine they approach they have. I, I think that there is a place 
in Western medicine to bring in spiritual healing and holistic approaches. I think it's happening more and more. It just isn't common yet. Yeah. There's this meme that Erica and I always show to to each other every time we see it, even though we've seen it like a thousand times, but I'm going to share it with the podcast now. (laughs) So the original post is, I'm both pro herbal medicine and pro vaccination because you can treat burns with aloe vera juice and sore throats with lavender infused honey, but you can't rid a country of polio with plants. And then somebody responded this with those like hands that are like, like high-fiving. And then there's like the, the big thing, uh, you know, the emphasis, this, (laughs) that's like the least important comment on this, but I spent the most amount of time on it. (laughs) And then someone else said, don't forget kids, jewel weed is a natural counter agent to poison ivy rashes, but it won't do shit against whooping cough. And then somebody else said, mint for nausea, valerian and chamomile for sleep, antibiotics for fucking infections. And then somebody else said, I will never not reblog this. And I agree. And that's Maggie and I. (laughs) That's what we've done ever since. Yes. (laughs) So that sums it up. (laughs) That sums it up. You you can have both. And both are equally valid and important. As always, except when you take it to either extreme. Yeah, because because there are people, I mean, we're a witchcraft podcast, so we are criticizing people who are in our cr- community, but there are people who are completely against any sort of spirituality that we haven't even touched. Yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Absolutely. There's a, another extreme we don't have critiques of. Or we do have critiques, we just haven't voiced them. <laughs> yes, because they too are... In, in their extreme belief that Western medicine is the only way to be and that anything outside of Western medicine is silly and doesn't exist and is ridiculous to even consider. On that note, let's talk about our herb of the week. This episode is brought to you by Alfalfa. I will start by talking about the medicinal properties and then Maggie will talk about the magical ones otherwise known as the purple medic and so I I just think that's fun I can just like it's like a little purple doctor running around so alfalfa is most commonly used as a diuretic for kidney conditions bladder and prostate conditions it's also really great for any kind of inflammation with asthma or arthritis and diabetes here's another one nothing works better for diabetes than insulin but you can supplement your insulin with some alfalfa. Alfalfa is a great source of vitamins A, C, E, and K4. It also is chock full of minerals, calcium, potassium, phosphorus, and iron. So alfalfa is great to throw onto a salad so that you can get all those vitamins and minerals, especially their sprouts, because as babies, they need those more to help them grow. And so when you eat them, when they are the babies, then it has more of those properties. I hope nobody clips this with a witch talking about eating babies. (laughs) It also has vitamin D in it. With vitamin D and how it helps us, and this is the same with mushrooms, is vitamin D has to be paired with calcium. And in order for vitamin D to be activated in alfalfa and mushrooms, it has to be exposed to the sun. Alfalfa needs to have been exposed to actual sunlight outdoors in order for that vitamin D to be present. And then it has to be paired with the calcium in order to, for it to be beneficial in our bodies. That's why vitamin D and calcium is pushed synthetically into like milk and juices and stuff like that, because it's hard to get it naturally. With your mushrooms, if you get store-bought mushrooms, if you set them outside for like 20 minutes before you use them to cook, that can help to activate the vitamin D. Otherwise, you're not getting any vitamin D from the mushrooms. Just a little aside. Side note. <laughs> Because I just think it's fascinating. It is. So alfalfa is very safe. You usually eat it orally, again, in like a salad, or you can add it to like a smoothie or a shake. Alfalfa is a passive herb. It corresponds with Venus and Jupiter, the Earth element, and Pisces and Virgo. The most common uses for alfalfa are for 
things like money and prosperity, as well as for anti-hunger. I think this is because it is a very nutritious plant. So that's probably where the association with anti-hunger comes from. And it's abundant. It grows abundantly. And it fixes nitrogen in the soil. Those are all things about alfalfa. If you keep it in a small jar in your cupboard or in your pantry, it can act as like an attractant uh, for abundance and to ward off any poverty or hunger. It's like a little, don't come in here, poverty or hunger, because the alfalfa is here. You can also burn it in a cauldron and use the ashes in an amulet for protection from hunger and poverty. You could also use those ashes from burning it, scatter them around your home for the same purpose. Wherever you live, scattering the ashes of the alfalfa around can prevent hunger and poverty. And then dried alfalfa is also good for any sort of money and prosperity workings and spell work. So again, it's all associated with attracting more wealth and prosperity and deterring any poverty or lack. So next week, we will be looking at our live. Oh, no, not next week. We're doing a bonus episode for Austria. So This week, later this week, look for our bonus episode. And in the incoming days, we'll be looking at our life through the lens of the Emperor Tarot card, a major arcana card. And this card is about power and authority. It is the father figure archetype. It's also about leadership and reason, being assertive, bringing order to chaos, establishing laws and family values, and all of that kind of stuff. If you have a story about the emperor, please send us a voicemail to we listen at talkwitchcraft.com. You can find out more about this episode by going to mumblesandthings.com slash blog slash 063. Join us in our bonus episode when we talk about the meaning of Osara or the spring equinox. Make sure that you are subscribed so that you are notified about each new episode. And to help other witches find the show, please leave a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram at Mumbles and Things. And if you have any other tips to add, tell us about it in the Talk Witchcraft Forum in the Mumbles Academy community. And don't forget to share this episode with your witchy friends and followers. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye. It's a puppy pants. Aw, puppy pants? Why is he wearing pants? No, he's a puppy pants. But why is he a puppy pants? Why is he pants? Because it's fun to say that. I have a kitty kilt. Kitty kilt? (laughs) It's a kitty kilt.